Here, you good? Yeah. Yeah. So, I think it's all, all right. Hello. Hey, uh, Constance, I'll need a mic stand as well. Mic stand. All right. Uh, welcome to the last convention of the year for me. <laughs> I'm already home right now. No, I I was in the next, there was another, what is it? Uh, another theater room. We were there waiting to go on at 3.15, so I, technically I was not late. He was right on time, they told us like, hey, we're early. How awesome would it be if I just walked on stage? Some other show. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for, yeah, thank you. Thank you guys for joining me here. Last convention of the year for myself. Anyone else? Last con? Yeah. yeah. All right. Pretty crazy year. Nice to be back. It's also nice to finish the convention uh, at a convention where, nice to finish the year at a convention where masks are not necessarily uh, uh, obligatory. So it's nice to uh, see so many of your smiling faces. Uh, that's something I definitely have missed over the past two years. So. If you've been to one of these panels before, I, I kind of will do a little Q&A, I draw while I talk. We don't have a device called an Elmo. An Elmo is a very small projection device. They're trying to get one, uh, so you can see what I'm drawing. Does anyone have any spare backing boards by chance? I've seen like maybe three. That's a crazy question to ask. No, no, no drugs. It's okay, just paper. Three is good. We have three. We have three. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I feel very ambitious today. All right, so uh, I'll just use the So it's dark in here too. Um, so it's hard for me to see everyone. How many of you have? Uh, is this the first time seeing me at a panel? Oh, that's a lot. Okay. All right. Who has seen me? All right. There's a lot of shy people, too. So, uh, all right. So, yeah, I wish I had the Elmo. Uh, I could live stream it off my phone and then you can watch it. <laughs> I'll try. I can take pictures on my phone and pass them around. Uh, I'm trying to think of other ways. I could draw a little and then do this. Can you see? Yeah. It's done. All right. Okay. All right. Let me, let me get set up. Let me kill one more time. Anyone have a question? I want to start. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, you can blurt it out. Um, Speak loudly. So I've been reading for a long time now. My dad is reading about Okay. Is your dad here? No, he's not. Okay. Okay, nice. Um, but I'm just using my girlfriend here to kind of just start a conversation that's small and very subtle. What do you think you're most known for? What am I most known for? <laughs> for your, I can say for her all day, but I, I mean, I can't explain that. Kind of yeah, so if you didn't hear, uh, he was saying that uh, he's here with his girlfriend and, and you're trying to turn to the dark side, right? Get her to read comics. And, uh, you talk me up a lot, and, and just, she just said, I don't care, right? She, her eyes glaze over, and you're saying, what, what do I think is the most meaningful work I've done that will make a difference in the eyes of your girlfriend, and maybe make her appreciate comics the way you appreciate my work? Well, first off, let me say, I appreciate you, despite your girlfriend, right? <laughs> like, there are gonna be haters in life. That's just, you go on the internet, that's, so I don't, doesn't bother me, but I know I have you in my corner, and that's all that really matters. Uh, in terms of work, um, gosh, you know, uh, uh, if you watch any of those X Men cartoons back in the 90s, no? She, was, she wasn't born yet? What? Uh oh. Yeah, so those cartoons. Uh, they're, they're kind of based on the designs of the characters that I drew on the X-Men when I worked on the X-Men back in the 90s. And uh, they filmed the cartoon in Toronto, uh, and we were working on the Wildcats cartoon in, in Toronto, and so one day we were both 
recording audio for our different shows, and the producers of the X-Men show, uh, they saw me, you know. Um, behind the scenes, there's no rivalries between Marvel and DC, everyone on there. And uh, so I went over, hung out with them, and said, hey, you want to voice something? And I said, sure. So there's an episode with Sentinels. Uh, there's a lot of episodes with Sentinels, unfortunately. But there's one where I, I am voicing the Sentinel. I go, stop, mutant, you know, but they, Yes, yes, this is, yes, 100%, yeah. But they modulated it, because of the Sentinel voice, so it sounded like, uh, you know, like, you couldn't tell it's me. But it was a damn good performance. <laughs> I, it's like, why am I drawing comics? Like, I could, I could just be a, a Sentinel, <laughs> you know? Uh, I have looked for that episode, but there's like six or seven different episodes, but, but I am one of them, yeah. I'm also a guard in that, uh, in a Wildcats episode that tries to stop the Wildcats and I get run over. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so that's my claim to fame. So if you like cartoons, that's what I've done. Yeah. Okay. I was on Sesame Street too, so I, I don't know. Some people care about that. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, yes, yeah, so they invited me on. It was still kind of during lockdown. I flew to New York, and uh, very few people, but it was strange because the puppeteers are underneath the table, and they're on like these little skateboard platforms so they can move around, and they have TV cameras underneath so they can see the, the puppets, so they could see, like, but it's reverse, so they look, if they turn right, looks left on the screen, I don't know. They're, it's amazing what they do. And the whole time I'm interacting with the Muppets and going, like, this, these look real, man. Who are these weird people? Who are these weird people on the ground? It's freaking me out. Um, but but when you interact with them, the, the Muppets do, like the puppeteers, bring them to life. It was an amazing, awesome experience. And then I watched with my youngest kids and they're like, like what are you doing? Why is dad on the screen on the TV? Whatever, but that was, that was really a lot of fun. You know, it was such a big part of my childhood growing up. I learned English from watching Sesame Street. We moved here when I was like five years old. So it was great to kind of have um, kind of full circle around things that were really meaningful and important to me in terms of my development, comic books, Sesame Street, and having them come together uh, years later was awesome. Uh, oh, was that the Elmo? Yeah, we're working on it. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll come back to you guys. Uh, you sir, yes, in the aisle, yeah. So I was uh, chatting with uh, Simon Beasley a little earlier today. We were talking about the great age of artists in the late 90s. You were a uh, part of that, just how exciting that Who was. Who were you talking to, sir? Um, Simon Beasley. Oh, Simon Beasley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, the artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we're talking about all the, the great artists of the late 90s. You were part of that. Is yeah, image crew and how exciting that was. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't sure there was going to be another age like that because maybe the publishers weren't eager to uh, bring artists' names into the sort of fame that exists then. You've been on both sides of this, so I was very curious to hear your perspective on whether there might be another great age of artists like there was that you were a part of at that time. Yeah, there's definitely no uh, internal movement to suppress artists or any creators. I, I would love to have big name creators. And, and, and I, I would probably argue that the great age of, I don't know, it's a pretty great age right now. I mean, look at it. Uh, um, Jorge Jimenez. Jorge Jimenez. Yeah. Jorge Jimenez is doing fantastic work. Rafael Grandpa, uh, Dan Moro, no, not Grandpa, Mora, Mora uh, Clay Man. I, there's so many great artists right now. Um, so, they might not necessarily pull the same kind of numbers that they did in the 90s commercially, but also, but I think the level of the artistry, the craftsmanship behind the art is superior today than the stuff that, that we did in the 90s. But it was, a, it was definitely what, what the kids say, it was a vibe back then, right? It was like a thing. And uh, people liked big, splashy art and, you know, uh, I've had a chance to like, kind of recreate images from that period of time and, and we 
level of exaggeration of the figure and physiques are it's a little over the top. I mean, I've dialed it back a lot since then, but um, it was fun. It was a fun time to draw. But uh, will it come back again? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, it really, that that period of artist was followed by a crash in the industry and then the rise of the writers, and we're still kind of, I think, in the afterglow of that movement. You know. But I say hi, hi to Simon for me once. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, red hat. Okay. Who are your biggest artistic inspirations when you were first starting out? My first biggest, uh, so when I was a kid growing up in the 70s and 80s, uh, I, I got my comics. I got 7-Eleven. I, I didn't really discover a comic book store, a dedicated comic book store until I was like 18, 17 or 18. Oh, okay. Um, is there a way to make this? Is there a light here? There is a light. That's better. Yeah. Right. All right. Uh, Art Adams and Mike, Mike Golden. So all those guys kind of have similarities in their style. Barry Windsor Smith later on as well. So my style is kind of a fusion of all the, the great artists that I, I really put under the name. Thank you. Oh. Yes, sir. Um, just with you uh, being from the deep vein of an uh, officer and having to come with like Black Adam on the red carpet, or we're always seeing you, you know, kind of owning the next product, how do you differentiate the line between doing the corporate side of it and then the artist in you that still does, you know, variant covers it seems like every month? Or so how do you balance those two things? That's a very good question. Uh, I think I balance it by not doing a lot of drawing, <laughs> you know? I think it's a lot harder. Uh, you know, I, I do the variant covers because those take about a day a piece, and I can do them at night or on the weekend. But a lot of days you're just tired from the day job, you know, of it all. Uh, although when I was in New York to promote Black Adam, I drew one of the covers in the hotel room, right? I was there, there was a, a day in between New York Comic Con and a couple days between Comic Con. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I don't want to stop drawing because I, I, I actually have this real fear that I'll lose the ability to draw. And, and if I skip like three days, it does feel real. And I go, like, what happened? <laughs> um, uh, but I, but I, I do love, you know, obviously uh, the day job of it all and, and getting those really cool opportunities to see these stories that we create come to life, right, in film and TV. So. Uh, I think the last 10 years of my life has really been trying to find that balance of the two, but um, I, I do feel like I have a couple more good runs, comic book runs in me, so someday, soon, I hope. Thank you. Yes, uh, jump over to the side. Yes, uh, uh, Timothy's dead. Oh. Yeah, I, I forget your name, sorry. Remember your kid's name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you ever go back uh, to pencil in a uh, if I could do it, I would really kind of understand growing up. Like when you're when you're first starting out, like everything you draw, you want out immediately so people can see it, and you're just super impatient. And I see that even in my young kids. When you get older, like myself, it's like I draw stuff and then we put on Instagram like two months later or something. And at that point, like who cares? I mean, it, for you, it's new, but for me, I've been looking at it for two months, so I'm less interested. In that. So, um, but I, I've, I've Kind of suppress this this need to show the work I've done immediately. So I've got like you know my photo album just filled with like covers I've drawn that haven't gone out there yet because I don't want to promote it, whatever. So you know, um, yeah. You're welcome. Right here. Oh, my shirt. Yes. You forgot your shirt. Somehow late Punisher War Journal, it like explodes. And I always made me wonder, was there something happening? Did something click? 
were you inspired by one particular artist or just something coming together? Because I mean, it just gets so incredible. And then it's it's what we all are familiar with in the X Men run, uh, as far as I can tell. Yeah, uh, that's a good question too. I d I don't know what happened. Um, <laughs> You say basically my artwork was crappy, and then all of a sudden it got good. So it's a tough one to answer. Uh, gosh. Uh, it's a very painful period of my life. Uh, no, I, I, I don't know if it was 10,000 hours, but I, I did start really drawing, you know, at, at, at the beginning, maybe every page was like 10 to 12 hours, no matter what. Um, so you're spending you know, 280, 300 hours an issue. So 300 hours an issue, or it'd be like 14 issues of Alpha Flight or something like that. So it's like, it's like three thousand, like, I don't know, it's like three or 4,000 hours per yearly run. So by the time I got to the X-Men, I had done a year, a little over a year of Alpha Flight, a year and a half of Punisher Wars, and also that's three and a half, that's, that's almost 10,000 hours. So I think that's it. Really, I didn't. I didn't have to do anything. I just just kept moving the pencil for ten thousand hours, and then ten thousand hours in one minute. It was like magic, right? And super easy. I don't know what happened, but I, I think that's probably a big part of it, you know. Because uh, I just remember when I was drawing things, um, every time I drew a shot of something, I was like, I've never drawn this before. I've never drawn a figure from this angle, or three figures in this pose, or a, a vehicle, like everything was new, and so it, I had to do reference, I had to draw, redraw, figure out perspective, figure out what I didn't know that I, you know, you don't know what you don't know, so that, trying to figure that out is, is complex. And then after 10,000 hours of that, I think you start repeating things, and you're like, oh, I've drawn someone from, uh, someone's upper back before, and so you can kind of, pull up that information, it's almost like muscle memory a little bit, right? So uh, there's a bit of that. And that's why I think if I skip three days of, of, of drawing, a lot of that information kind of recedes, and then I kind of am left questioning, like, do I know what I think I know, or am I, you know, has it, like, you know, if you've ever learned anything in your life, like playing the piano or a foreign language, if you don't exercise that, that set of muscles in your brain, it atrophies. And uh, uh, I do believe that if, you, if I stopped, that I would like shark, like not, you know, like die, right? Like I wouldn't be able to survive. So, um, but yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Also, X-Men were my favorite characters growing up. So getting that moment, sort of being handled, handed the mantle to this prize, you know, franchise and being able to kind of chart its creative direction was just something that I think just gave gave everything I did a little more, you know, creative oomph. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, young man in the green. professional artist, so I feel like any character is something I want to draw. Uh, what's your favorite character? Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's my answer too. Drawing's just fun. What? Drawing's just fun. Yeah, drawing is just fun. That That is the root of what we do. Like, F, yeah. Very, uh, very profound. Very profound, but um, a lot of what I love about the drawing of it is that it does take me back to my childhood. So like sitting, you know, laying on the kitchen floor, drawing pages of art while my mom, you know, cooking dinner or whatever. Uh, we traveled around the country in a station wagon every summer. And I remember just laying in the back of the car on these endless freeways, just with a pad of paper, just drawing characters and scenes and stuff like that. So there's not like a, a character per se where you're like, oh, this character is so much cooler than another character. There's certain, certainly characters I don't like drawing just because the, the level of detail in the costumes, like Aquaman, Captain America, uh, 
Spider-Man, right? All the webs, the little uh, chain link, all that stuff is very time consuming, so that's kind of the drag. But for the most part, I, I like drawing all the characters because it's fun, drawing is fun, like you said. Drawing the same character over and over after a while gets a little tiring, even if it's Batman, right? So uh, it's nice to have Batman with Robin because Robin is such a counterweight to Batman's seriousness. He's lighter, more bouncy, fights differently, very bright, you know, primary color, uh, mostly primary color <laughs> costume. Batman's kind of shadowy and in the darkness. So it's nice to have that just positioning, that contrast between visual elements. And so that keeps things interesting for me. Okay. Let me jump over here. Right there. Um, I was just wondering, um, I know in the 90s we were kind of, we wanted things new and exciting. Yes. And so we kind of got away from the golden age and the silver age, and now there seems to be a a lot of people my age and younger kind of wondering and looking back at the golden age and the silver age, and I was wondering if that also is kind of influencing your side of the business. When you say the golden and silver age, are you talking about your golden? Oh, so okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 like the, the 30s, actual 30s and 40s. Yeah. And, uh, so you're you're wondering if people are are, are extra nostalgic these days? Yeah. I don't. There seems to be a very strong nostalgia for the '90s. So um, that's exciting for me because <laughs> <laughs> I never thought when I was drawing comics in the '90s, I would just wait 30 years. People really appreciate this. <laughs> they might not like it now because they're a bunch of haters. Uh, <laughs> 30 years, we wait and see. Because I would have slept off, I would have hung, I would have had more fun, I would have gone out. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I don't know. It's just the power of nostalgia, and I think, I think with each successive generation, adults have been hanging on to their childhood attachments longer and longer, right? Like, so if you look at the generation that preceded me, like, you know, they became adults, and they also look like adults by the time they were fifty, you know, and and. Today I see grown men like still skateboarding. And no, no, you know, no judgment, <laughs> unless you're in, you know, in my way. Uh, but, but, you know, and and, and you see uh, family, like fathers and mothers sharing their fandom with their kids, right? Or grandparents sharing with their grandchildren. It's just something that did not exist when I was growing up. Like, you know, like you were, you were ridiculed if you hung on to things that from your childhood. Right? Like you're still playing with GI Joe's, or you're still reading comic books. That's what most kids do. You know, start drinking beer. You know, I mean, did that too. But anyway, uh, so th there was always that kind of uh, transition from childhood to adulthood. And I just see a lot more adults really enjoying their, you know, playing video games or skateboarding or whatever, which is fine. Like it's great. It's just. Um, I, I think times have changed, and, and so you see that power of fandom now, and how it drives pop culture, both on social media, and the box office, and ratings, all that stuff. It's fascinating to watch, because the age spread is so much wider or older than it would have been when I was, you know, a fan. said when they landed you and you decided to join image that's when it just it, it super exploded so I'm just curious to know you know you were Marvel's like hottest artist and so incredibly popular what was your motivation and your mindset of deciding to break away and do your own thing like what finally motivated you to, to take that leap of faith on yourself uh, uh, gosh that's a that's a big question. Um, I, I think I was just kind of young and stupid. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the truth of it because, because um, it was this 
stupid decision. Uh, I, was, I was working at the biggest comic book company on the biggest selling book, making pretty good money, and a lot of people seemed to enjoy what I was working on, and that was the dream I had when I got into comics. I wanted to like, get into comics so I can draw the X-Men and you know, tell all these stories. And that happened, right? And then I left, right? And, and, and that would have been an awful mistake if things didn't work out. Um, but I think I was like 27, maybe? I don't know, and that seemed old at the time, but looking back on it now, over double that age, I'm like, uh, you know, there's not much difference from my point of view between a 12 year old and a 27 year old. Uh, and so I, I feel like it was not probably the greatest decision, but it, I, I, it, was, it was consistent with a young adult at that time who was probably feeling like, you know, maybe a little invincible, like maybe, and also it was with, my peers, right? And so having that collective courage to just make a collectively bad decision, that was, you know, cool. Like, you know, and, and also, but also I, I, I take it back to a bad decision. I, I think those are the years you should be taking risks, right? It's, it's a lot harder to do when you have a mortgage and a bunch of kids. Um, you know, when you're relatively young, I'd say like, go for it. Like you can lose everything you own three or four times over in your 20s before you get to your 30s, but you'll learn a lot in, in that process. You all, I think you, you learn more in failure than you do in success. And uh, so yeah, that, that was probably the, the rationale behind it. It's like part like arrogance, like no one can hurt us, like, like we've got it made. Like, you know, we're on top of the world, you know? And, uh, but, but also just like this, this sense like, uh, Let's, let's try something that hasn't been done before, right? But I think that's that's pretty typical of, of younger folks, right? Being more open to something different. Um, check the tape here. Right there. You forgot the yellow switch. So getting back to the uh, kind of explosion of art that happened in the 90s and just kind of the evolution of comics in general, um, is there any thoughts you have about how much the digital age has kind of contributed to that and where it kind of puts us right now with like comic streaming services? And uh, but in regards to the 90s though? Just like how it's changed throughout oh. the years, anything like substantial to the industry yeah. that you've noticed? Yeah, things have definitely changed. Well, first off, I think in terms of creating art, a lot, it, we've already reached that tipping point and, and it's already changed quite a bit. Like most young artists today work um, digitally, right? So they work on iPads or um, you know, Photoshop or whatever. Uh, and that's very different. 
different from obviously the way you know, uh, people in my generation. I still draw on paper. Uh, I have a, a Cintiq, but I use that really for color corrections or if I'm doing design work and I need to basically do iterations of the same design in slightly different uh, you know, looks or whatever, so I can either do it that way. I think uh, even digital comics uh, change the reading experience. A lot of people, last time we checked, uh, more people were reading comics like on their phones than on iPads, right? Uh, and, and when you read on your phone, it's a panel to panel swipe. You're reading panel to panel. And uh, when I draw a page, I'm, I'm composing all the panels to be on a page. It's, it's meant to be seen together and then read individually. And if I draw a very small panel, I, that, that means that's supposed to be a less important panel than a bigger panel, like a double page spread, but on the phone, the double page spread gets shrunk the most to the same size as your phone. And then the little panel, which is the most unimportant, gets expanded to fill the screen. So there's a, there's a uh, counterintuitiveness to reading panel by panel on your phone uh, that runs contradictory to the way I think about the images I'm putting on a page and the storytelling. So I don't know what, what that means if your generation is screwed forever, it might be. I don't, we don't know the scientific results, gentlemen, that is, sir, I don't know. Uh, so maybe in 15 years we'll say like, that whole generation, they, we lost a whole generation of literate kids, <laughs> you know, like, whatever. Uh, uh, but I do think it's fascinating that, that um, technology changes things in, in inadvertent and unexpected ways. And even you know, creating digital art, you don't have an original, and, but then NFTs came around, and so that was interesting for you know two weeks. And then uh, <laughs> some, some people made some real money and lost it all. It's uh, very stupid. Uh, and uh, so yeah, I, I think about technology quite a bit. Also in terms of the storytelling, um, the way social media kind of connects fans with talent and the stories we tell, and it used to be that, um, you know, you would hear back in, in, in the days when you know, I was coming up, like, oh, we, you know, the creators, they, they're creating work for themselves, it's not for their fans. But I, I, I can't imagine a single creator feeling that way today, right? Because it's just, the, that interaction is omnipresent, it's just there 24-7. We are on our devices, we are getting feedback, and, opinions from strangers and fans and everything, and it, it has to have a cumulative effect on the work we do. So again, I don't know what the impact would be for another 15 years. I'm doing a study. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, yeah, that's the stuff I think about. All right, front row here. It's a, it's partly physical, but it's a, a, also a 
large part mental, right? Like you can't give up after mile 12. You gotta keep pushing through there, whatever, 27 or whatever it is. So doing a monthly comic is not just about hitting that same first deadline. The first deadline is the easiest. Tell, like, talk to me when you get to the third issue, the fourth issue in a row. You're gonna feel it physically, mentally, and so, and it's a cumulative effect. It, it doesn't just go away. Like it, it, whatever stress and, and hardship you're feeling, it, 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 it accumulates like, you know, rust, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it just accumulates on, on your, in your mind and your body and it gets harder and harder. So I, I think um, um, you, you, you just need to have a lot of runway ahead of you and know that um, you're gonna undertake this big project. You just can't make that decision lightly, I'm trying to say. You gotta think about it as if you're running the marathon and um, you know, be willing to put that time in, that commitment in, and that's not just your commitment, but also your family's commitment because they're not going to see you as much, right? You're going to be drawing. You know, I when I was just a freelancer, I would draw Christmas Day, I would draw Thanksgiving, I would draw like it didn't matter what day. It was all dependent on getting the work done by the deadline. Um, and there were plenty of Mondays where I did nothing as well, <laughs> to be fair, uh, but. That's the life. It's it's your your the great thing is that you're you're working on your schedule, and the worst thing is that you're working on your schedule, and, and that doesn't necessarily align with that one, like 99 percent of the rest of the world. Right? So that can be wrong. Uh, and then as far as the panel, uh, yeah, uh, Paul Dano uh, was the special guest on that. That was the first panel we've done like that. We reduced the number of panels we we had at San Diego this year. Uh, it would be great to continue to have. Uh, folks from sort of outside the traditional comic book space come and, and come to a DC panel and kind of talk about their work. That one was just real like serendipity, like that whole project that it was, you know, um, basically like Matt Reeves reached out and he basically said, look, Paul really got deep into this character and created all these books as if he were the character, like, like diaries, right? Like detailing his descent into and uh, he felt it was a shame to like let all that work kind of go to waste, but that, that Paul had kind of worked out this whole origin of the character that you don't see on the screen at all. And so we took a couple meetings and we were super intrigued by his pitch and he basically took a lot of his notes um, and, and made it into a story. And so, uh, yeah, and a lot of times those things don't ever come to fruition, right? They start, you know, people talk about it Get, get excited about it, but then when you sit down and actually have to do the work, it's like running that marathon again. But to his credit, Paul came through and, and delivered it, so it's a fantastic experience. Yeah, um, all right, so 344. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, let me just get a couple more questions. Let me finish this up and then I'll have one more sketch. Uh, so yeah, so if you haven't been to the panel before, I, I, so I answer questions and I do these sketches and then uh, we're gonna give them away. I, I like giving sketches away in this window of time just because we're in the holidays and so I feel like you know people can get something cool that they well, hopefully cool <laughs> uh, and they can give it to you know their loved ones for, as a Christmas gift. And anyone giving away a sketch? No? No, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just giving away. Okay, yeah. So anyway. Uh, yes, again? No. Yes. About like oh that that's a nod to that storyline by you know Jeff Johns or you know Chris Claremont or whatever that that's the stuff that kind of jumps out at me. Uh, 
I did like Namor and his little flappy wings. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, if I ever draw that character again, I'm gonna have the colorist um, blur the wings every time. Um, that was, that was cool seeing Gambit in that movie. I, that wasn't the greatest movie. But it's, it's, no, it's fine. I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to be a hater. Or everyone here. Uh, that was cool. That was cool. All right. So uh, to give these away, I asked for unusual things. Um, so those of you who have been to a panel might be at an advantage. Uh, anyone here from my Twitch stream? We've got, uh, we have two mods. We've got Chris Viegro and PK over here. Say hi. Uh, and so sometimes they have an advantage as well. Uh, so anyway, I started easy. Uh, so this, this wonderful piece. Can you see it? Why is it so large? <laughs> Say, uh, what's that? <laughs> fingernail polish, blue, a blue fingernail polish. Wait, that just got really yeah, but because everyone might have, all right, fingernail polish. You have fingernail polish. Hold it up, don't jump up. Yeah, just, no, 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 no one has, like, if you have it, stand it. I just showed up on There you go. What do you got? No, no, not on your finger. No, you have to have it in the bottle. Sorry. Oh. 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 I've got clear fingernail. No. Uh, <laughs> No one has a, a bottle of, all right, uh, rubber cement? No, no huffers here? All right, uh, what did I say? I don't even know what I said. Uh, they don't have a receipt from Taco Bell, one of my favorite restaurants. No one eats a Taco Bell here? I'm looking at some of you. Know. What? What? No, the app now. The app? Yeah. No, it has to be a physical receipt. Sorry. If you have it, hold it in the air. <laughs> okay. Uh, does anyone have a, a wooden toothpick? Oh my God, a Monopoly piece. You got, what, what do you guys carry with you? I, is it all the stuff? Uh, what, what's that? Dice. Dice? Wooden toothpick. <laughs> That was on the toothpick and the jacket. All right, come on up. Who should I make this out to? Lawson? L A W S O N? You're going to make a gift? That's so kind of you. Amelia, wow. Why do you carry a wooden, uh, why do you have a toothpick, sir? Uh, I, I always have a toothpick. <laughs> huh? Oh! All right, I'm just gonna start over. Uh, <laughs> heads up, I sound weird. Uh, yeah, I've got a lot. I've got a lot. 
Yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot. Uh, yeah, that's about, Green Lantern sounds good though, too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Four o'clock, right? We have five minutes? Oh, we're clear. Okay, all right. Uh, all right, so Cyclops. Uh, uh, does anyone have an uh, unused band aid? I do. No, hold up. Oh, we got one. In the mouse ears. Oh. Wait, are those mouse ears? I'm sorry, ma'am. I said yeah. those mouse ears. <laughs> oh, unused. Unused. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah.